Like I love going through like the big data bowl projects and seeing how people are tying player tracking information to like actual drills that people do and trying to measure like information from the combine and then and then how that information correlates to what a player does in an NFL game and then they're using player tracking data to kind of link the two that is somewhat player development as well we're talking about how does a player go from the drill to the on field advantage uh, that that's uh, that's truly where the 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 era of sports analytics are going, in my opinion. Welcome to another episode of the Football Analytics Show. My name is Ed Fang, your host. And today I'm thrilled to have Nick Wan on the show. He's the director of analytics for the Cincinnati Reds. Among other topics, we talk about what he does in his job for the Reds, the new types of analytics going on in baseball, and the prospects for the Reds in the future. We talk about inspiration for his work and creativity in general. And then we get into some other jobs he has had, including his work for KFC. The Football Analytics Show is brought to you by the Power Ranks Sports Betting Newsletter. This is a free service that gives data-driven betting information that is three things. One, valuable. Two, concise. Three, entertaining. Smarter sports betting in under five minutes. If you sign up, I'll send you my top five sports betting podcast episodes. This is an education for your ears. To get this free service, go to thepowerrank.com. That is my site for sports betting information based on data and analytics. Once again, that's thepowerrank.com. Joining me on this episode of the Football Analytics Show is Nick Wan. He is the Director of Analytics for the Cincinnati Reds. Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I really appreciate you, uh, you know, finding the time in, in a really busy time of year for you. Nick, before we uh, get into baseball, I want to know a little bit more about your story. How did you get into baseball based on your background in, in neuroscience? Yeah, my journey into baseball started with blogging back when people still blog. Do people still, do you know, people still blog? People still blog. I have a blog on my site. Do, is that some people go there? <laughs> I, f- I feel like I feel like blogging is becoming a lost art, you know. So, uh, I, I I used to have a very uh, I used to keep up with my blog pretty often, and uh, uh, before I was into sports analytics, I would write a lot about music and live music and do music reviews. When I went to grad school, I realized I wasn't really focused too much on the music scene anymore. So I ended up uh, keeping my writing and blogging hobby going by uh, writing about popular science and, and psychology and neuroscience and statistics that are used in neuroscience and psychology and to expand on my knowledge of statistics and to really like ingrain myself and know statistics inside and out, I always try to apply my statistics to sports. So any weird, esoteric, nuanced statistics that I learned in psychology or neuroscience, I would apply to typically basketball. That was just the data that I found. Uh, And I I had access to basketball data and basketball data was something I was pretty comfortable thinking about. And I learned the whole Dean Oliver four factors thing. I thought it was like, pretty interesting stuff. So I started trying to apply, um, I started trying to apply my neuroscience time series analysis stuff to basketball. Uh, and it was, it had some paltry results, but it kept me engaged with my statistics and continuing my dissertation and being able to explain my statistics in front of people. And it also kept me blogging and it also kept me interested in seeing and analyzing a game from a different perspective. So I wrote this blog post about the curtain of distraction at Arizona State University. 
and it ended up going viral. And Justin Wolfers at the New York Times picked it up and he wanted to use the data that I produced and the analysis that I did on my blog as a upshot post. And yeah, and so he did all the work. Uh, I, I was featured on the upshot and then I guess it was a slow news week. He texts me not long, like I think a day later, and he said, if you're near a New York Times paper, you made it to the front page. And so <laughs> I, and like I, I was living in like rural Utah at the time. So there's not a lot of New York Times media <laughs> around sure. rural, rural Utah. So I find the one place that had a New York Times. Uh, and sure enough, it was, uh, it, b- bottom, f- it was bottom fold. Okay. Bottom fold, but still the front page. Yeah. That's very uh, cool. Cause you, you actually found, I was looking at that article. You actually found that the distractions that the Arizona state fans be hot for opponent free throw shooting was having a s- statistically significant effect. Yeah, it was. Well, ju- I, I always try to walk this back a little cause I've been asked this over the years uh, my blog post actually state the blog doesn't exist anymore, but the the blog post does state that the the raw data doesn't scream. There's a difference. There's not a statistically significant difference, but Justin Wolfers had some some different ways to analyze it, and he found statistically significant differences. And he also controlled for more things than I did, so perhaps there is, but in my initial analysis, there wasn't. Oh, that's interesting. So. I mean, that's kind of another level, right? Because Justin Wolfer is very well known. I believe he's an economist. Actually did more analysis based on data that you had collected and code that you had started writing. That's right. That's right. It was um, it was actually pretty cool to see just another take on a data set that I had kind of hobbled together. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Did this uh, help you get into the sports world a little bit later, these connections? Um, well, I would say that the personally, I think it helped in terms of my confidence of applying to sports jobs. Uh, at the time, I was a neuroscience grad student, and I didn't really get much exposure to sports industry or sports analytics. I didn't play sports growing up. I was a casual viewer of sports. Uh, the most I would do is like basketball data analytics on a, as a hobby, right? So. Uh, I, it never dawned on me that the sports industry and the sports analytics industry was closer to, to my skill set than, than, uh, than I had perceived. So my, uh, after getting on the front page of the New York Times, I was like, well, I wonder how close an actual job full time in sports really is. And so over the next year, I went to different sports conferences, just like, you know, I'm still an academic at heart. So I'm like, where do I go to see the newest sports analytics? Maybe there's a sports analytics conference. So I went to sports analytics conferences, networked a little and found out that, you know, people apply in the off seasons of the major sports teams. And that's typically when the teams are, are doing the most looking for uh, analytical help. Absolutely. So for this New York times piece, did, did Justin Wolfers find your blog post? He did. He he reached out to me, and uh, he I don't know how he found it. I maybe he I'm this was back in the Google Reader days, so maybe I was just the one of the many Google Reader feeds of his. Yeah, yeah, excellent. All right, so you've done all this work. You're getting your PhD in in Logan, Utah. I can't imagine why they don't recruit baseball analysts in Logan, Utah, but you claim it's quite rural. So, so I'll take your word for it there. And then what happens next? Uh, after, uh, after getting my PhD, uh, I did, I, I started applying to a bunch of different sports teams in basketball and in baseball. And I was surprised to find out people were actually interested in my skill set. I thought not being a statistician, not being a computer scientist was going to hurt my chances, but I ended up getting a lot of different calls back and went through a lot of different interviews and ended up landing on the Reds. They just were interested in my very diverse 
perspective and background. So uh, I I thought that was welcoming. I thought like that is what I bring to the table. I'm not. I, I never played. I this isn't something that uh, I'm used to in terms of reading fan graphs and baseball prospectus. I thought bringing a fresh perspective with a bunch of different statistical processes uh, was going to be an advantage for for the Reds. Yeah, absolutely, and that, and that's what it turned out to be, right? Uh, abs one hundred percent. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so, Nick, let's move into a little bit more about the work that you've done with the Reds. Obviously, you can't talk about everything that you do, but can you give us a sense for the type of projects that you work on as an analytics director in, in baseball? Sure. My director responsibility is, is definitely less hands-on keyboard than uh, a data scientist or an analyst. I still have one or two pet projects that I lead and a lucky intern every now and then gets to help me out on those if they find it interesting. Uh, Most of my work is project management, uh, being a part of decision-making meetings, making sure I'm the main communicator to different stakeholders across the organization, whether it's coaches or different staff members or different players or whomever really needs either information or wants to collaborate on analytics. Um, That's, that's truly my main responsibilities. My, my secondary responsibilities are your, your typical technical data scientist things like documentation and code review and uh, a little exploratory analyses here and there and uh, logging projects from stakeholders in kickoff meetings and taking notes. <laughs> That's uh, uh, a bunch of different things, but uh, uh, definitely less hands on keyboard nowadays. Right. So, yeah. So the type of projects, right. I mean, you're, you're, you're the director now, right. And so obviously you're involved in things like the, the major league baseball draft and, and the trade deadline and, I presume that that people that are you know, maybe your GM is just going to come to you and ask you questions about, oh, what do you think about this and, and whether you can lend a, a quantitative perspective? That's exactly how it comes comes to be in my role. I usually have a lot of different people who represent their like their respective groups, whether it's pro scouting, amateur scouting, uh, straight from Nick Crawler GM, different assistant GMs. Uh, I usually am the person who is either one, representing analytics in terms of what we currently have, or two, developing something new in order to specifically answer a question. And that's where, uh, you know, that's that's truly where the team comes into play. So my analytics team really, really helps me out on on, on those types of projects. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I definitely I appreciate your uh, uh, being able to come on this podcast, right? Because we're right. We're after the Major League Baseball draft and uh, the trade deadline is next week. So I definitely appreciate that. When you're looking at uh, like just obviously we don't have access to the data that you do working for a Major League Baseball team. But, you know, if you're trying to evaluate a player like what publicly available metrics might you look at or would you recommend that someone like myself who's not a baseball insider what would you look at um well i think i think there's one perspective that's that's somewhat uh i think we always skip a step like it's like in in analytics and in and in particularly in just math in general you got to follow the instructions you have to follow the formula a lot of the time and if you skip steps you, you miss a lot of very basic information or context. So, you know, my my heart says, yeah, we should be looking more at WOBA. We should be looking more at different weighted metrics that are weighted by run values. We should be looking at different statistics that offer uh, a valuation on wins or wins above replacement or uh, runs above average or whatever it might be. Uh, but some 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 of that still requires the the base level of knowledge of how those numbers are calculated and the majority of those numbers are still event related right like you still have to hit a single you still have to walk you still have to hit uh home runs or you still have to count strikeouts and uh swings and misses and all these different event related metrics so if you are looking for event related metrics i'd say 
you know, you could pick your poison at this point. There is a pretty specific set of advanced analytics out there, like oh, WOBA or WAR or uh, ISO, whatever these whatever these t- uh, different public available metrics are. And then uh, Baseball Savant has uh, a, a little more in terms of the context of them. Uh, but I think the the industry itself, in terms of the the public perception of analytics is really more angled towards process-based metrics. So uh, we're looking less about strikeouts and more about stuff or like, uh, that's really more of a colloquial term of uh, the amount of movement of a pitch irrespective of the zone. So if you throw a slider and it's a really horizontal, it's horizontal break is, you know, 12 to 20 inches like that's a pretty strong breaking ball that starts on one side of the plate and sweeps across to the other side of the plate that's a lot of stuff coming from a particular pitch and and that's not really linked to any one event that doesn't say there's a strike doesn't say there's a ball that doesn't say whether it gets hit hard or hit at all it just says whether or not the pitch moves in a particular way and the industry in the public is moving towards more of these process or uh, things that a player can control that's irrespective of the event that's tied to it. Yeah, for sure. So this has been a revelation with like the stat cast data, right? Where you can actually get the movement on the pitch that you were just talking about. Yeah. I And it really, it was like both stat cast and track man together. And then a lot, a lot of smart people to, to investigate this, whether it was on their free time or if they were working on teams and uh, inevitably someone smart figured out what people were doing. But I'd say it goes a l- even deeper than that at this point. Uh, there's a lot of people out there looking at biomechanics data now, or they're looking at, uh, you know, using like computer vision techniques to extract that swing path or, uh, you know, how a, a player generates power, uh, you know, in terms of velocity as a pitcher, uh, there's a lot of different techniques people are using. They're being really creative with, it's not just the amount of data we have, it's the amount of ways we could capture data as well. And and as like computer vision or uh, ways to track information just by watching the game on on a video broadcast of some sort, uh, as that uh, advances, I, I feel like just publicly available data also advances and and ultimately publicly available research uh, becomes better and better. For sure. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the player development stuff, I remember reading Astro Ball and at the end, well, I mean, there was obviously a lot of talk about what the Astros did in terms of, you know, evaluating prospects. And, but at the end, he talked about the next frontier being analytics for player development. And it sounds like, what you're talking about here in terms of like what computer vision analysis of a swing is, is directly in line with that, right? Like how can you analyze an 18 year old swing to help him improve that? Yeah. Right. No, absolutely. I'd say player development and analytics in player development. And when we talk about player development, we really are talking about the development of a player. We're not talking about young players who are already good. We're talking about making a good player. Great. We're talking about making an average player good. We're talking about taking taking a flyer on a player who might be undervalued because of your traditional reasons and turning that player into something that's extremely valuable because we found uh, optimizations in there, whether it's mechanics or whether it's uh, a, the, a way they particularly do something. Those are definitely the uh, uh, advancements happening in baseball and really just I, I personally, I think it's across a many different sports right now. Like we see that in the NFL too, with different player tracking metrics. Like I love going through like the big data bowl projects and seeing how people are tying player tracking information to like actual drills that people do and trying to measure like me- information from the combine. And then, and then how that information correlates to what a player does in an NFL game. And then they're using player tracking data to kind of link the two. That is somewhat player development as well. We're talking about how does a player go from the drill to the on field advantage? Uh, that that's, uh, that's truly where the, the, the era of sports analytics are going in my opinion. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's really interesting, right? Because you just have so limited data in football, right? If you can make any sense out of practice data or combine data, you're really going to get ahead, I would think. Absolutely. And uh, the more the more Mike Lopez and and the guys over at a uh, NFL research and development or whatever they're calling it, uh, the more they release player tracking data, I feel like the more you're you're going to be uh, the more you're going to have that ability to link, in my opinion, relatively noisy data and then turn that relatively noisy data into extremely useful or informative data. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We'll see how that evolves in in the upcoming years. So Nick, when when we're talking about people that are in analytics for player development, is a lot of that being done in-house with the Reds or is it like a player, you know, shelling out his own money to find an expert that can help him do better so he can get that next big contract? I I mean, we definitely at the Reds we have an in-house team and they they are dedicated to whatever is the priority and every department has their own priorities. Sometimes that priority is specific to a set of players and maybe even one player. Sometimes the priority is specific to uh, being able to get information right for the entire organization of players. I'd say the I'd say there's a spectrum of players specifically who uh, one, it's like an X and Y axis, uh, where the X axis is like the spectrum of how interested they are in uh, implementing analytics, and then the Y axis might be how interest, uh, how how um, how much they are going to seek out help on their own. And so, I think like at the very maximal point of both of these axes you have like pitchers going to drive line so these are professional pitchers seeking out independent pitching help that is analytics driven and then at the probably at the origin you have a baseball player who doesn't care about any analytics who won't seek out anything and then you have just the spectrum in between so sometimes players do seek out drive line Sometimes and and really they're more interested and and less wanting to implement anything. They just want to see what's going on. Sometimes you have people going uh, their own way and not necessarily towards the independent an- analytics and having independent coaches. But maybe they're interested in reading about it and and doing it on their own. And then also maybe they're interested in talking to the analytics. The department in terms of how they can improve themselves. What are we seeing in them? How can we work together to to uh, improve or optimize their performance? For sure. And you know, if any player does come to you as an organization and says, "I want help," then you guys have the resources to do that. I would presume, right? A hundred percent. It's it's the. I mean, we get we get paid to to analytically help this organization. Yeah. Yeah. And I would also think there there's a big market for independent companies to to help with player development just because I'm starting to personally see how invested this entire country is in youth sports and how intense it is. And so there's probably like a lot of what, fourteen to eighteen year olds out there that whose parents will pony up for whatever help they can possibly get for whatever <laughs> sport. And it sounds like baseball is like at the head there. Yeah, I mean the we use like some of some of the hardware that's used around the league professionally is hardware that you could go out and buy yourself and it's you know anywhere from hundreds to tens of thousands of dollars and for some some people that's accessible to them and they're able to purchase one for their backyard and and they can you know track their pitches on a rap soto if they want or or get high speed camera shots of their grip as they throw fastballs or curveballs or something. That's wild. <laughs> so there's like high school kids sitting out there with like a ten thousand oh, dollar piece oh, of absolutely. hardware. Absolutely. Or or I mean like more realistically, it's like uh high schoolers who have moved to an area because there's access to those resources just readily available. Whether it's loaners from the school or whether it's like a, a facility that has that kind of equipment. Uh, people seek that stuff out if they're not able to just straight up buy one themselves. Right. 
Yeah, that's fascinating. So, Nick, uh, let's talk about the Reds. Uh, you guys got off to maybe the worst start <laughs> I've ever seen, 3-22. and 22. <laughs> Didn't look good in the numbers, uh, but you have pushed uh, almost to 500 since then. Uh, sorry, the, your record since then has been pushing 500. What are the prospects f- uh, for the f- franchise? Well, this season, uh, like you said, it started off very disappointing. No one, no one ever wants to be in a position where you're you're three and twenty two. Uh, there's a lot of reasons where perhaps that's the case. Uh, why we get to that number, um, where we are now, uh, definitely doing better than that early part of the season. Uh, trade deadline is very interesting right now. Yeah, uh, you know there. There's a uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of hot gossip going around about our team. Yep. I <laughs> um, can't really speak too much to what what is hot and what is not. But I actually I, I have a question for you. I I'm wondering if you because in football this is probably the, it's probably very similar. Um, there's been like a there's been like a lot of fake MLB leak accounts and they almost always get like canceled or even just suspended. I, my question to you, uh, whether it's ML, uh, it doesn't have to be MLB. It could be like football related for those like leak accounts that are associated to zero sources and are always wrong. How old do you think the people are making those accounts? Oh, I don't know. I would, I would probably say, I don't know, 17 to 20. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I I think the two I think it's like a there's like a bimodal distribution of age that I've been getting. There's the people who think that these are like the anywhere between fourteen and twenty, really young, no life, very bored in the summer people, or the this like early thirties like needs a feeling of importance kind of group of people. Like it could be one or the other, but I don't hear anyone saying like, "Oh, that's a twenty-seven-year-old." No one's saying that. It's always like the sixteen-year-old or the thirty-one-year-old. Yeah. Well, I I think when you're young, you just you just have time, right? <laughs> I, as I as I as I watch my kids uh, sit in my house over the summer, like you just have time to do stuff, right? You can be doing great in school and sports and and all that stuff, and and you just have time, and so that's why I feel like. Uh, that's the case for like, that's why I would make the case for the younger age. And then of course, you know, when you get into thirties or I would even argue your forties where I'm at, um, yes, there's, there's a desire to like (laughs) make a name for yourself, no matter, no matter, uh, how morally dubious, uh, the activities might be. So, and then if you're older, then you just don't know anything about technology. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I don't, uh, I, I love, I love my parents. I don't see my parents making burner accounts to like troll NFL Twitter, you know? Right. Yeah. No, they're just from a different era. Right. So <laughs> like they, they're, they're in an era in which the majority of their human interactions were face to face where you, you just couldn't be like that. Right. <laughs> that's, that's right. And then there's a, a new generation where we're like, Oh, Hey, I can be an egg on Twitter. Let me take this to the full extent that, um, but let me take it to its full extent, which is why, you know, we always talk about how Twitter is accessible and in general it is. And, you know, it's the anonymity, right? That, that allows you to do that. Well, like I, I'm from the Bay. So I, I always, I'm interested, I'm always, I'm interested in the idea of like, what would Twitter be like during the Joe Montana, Steve Young quarterback right. controversy? And then ultimately with Joe Montana going to the chiefs, like what would have that, what would that have been like on Twitter? You know? I mean, I think it would be like, it would be like, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's gotta be a good one recently. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it would be, it would be irrational and a lot of people, uh, saying things that they wouldn't say (laughs) to someone. I mean, I don't know. (laughs) Um, but yeah, you know, and, and you know, Twitter in general is a good thing. Um, I met you because I came down to a happy hour that I found out existed uh, through Twitter and uh, Eric Eager's Twitter account. So, you know, there's definitely are some good things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That was, that, that was fun. You coming down. Thanks for coming down by the way. Yeah, no, it was great. It was a lot of fun. And um, 
you know, Eric's telling me to, to get one going up here. So maybe we can get you to come up here uh, when things are a little easier for you. Oh, uh, I'd love up that. Here, up here being love Ann Arbor. So, um, but yeah, back to the Reds. Like, so what, what can we expect in the future? You were, you were talking very highly of, of uh, the prospects that you guys have in your farm fit system. Is it a matter of, you know, letting kids like Hunter Green and all these other prospects in the minors carry this franchise or, or, or is it going to be potentially uh, more of a teardown? No, the, the anal- from the analytics perspective, the object is to add value from, from every point of view. So whether it's adding major league pieces or helping develop players through the minor league system or helping acquire players through, uh, through the amateur draft or through the international system, there's always an ability to, to improve uh, everywhere. And, and I think one of the, the big things that at least we're trying to, to build here, at least from the analytics perspective, is uh, sustained success, not just, you know, uh, a blip on the radar and then we have to, to come back and, and do it all over again. And we, we want every year to be a championship caliber year. So... Uh, to get there does take a uh, a lot of a lot of hard work to to align the organization in that way. So, in my opinion, I do think we're we're seeing a lot of alignment from all of our groups, from all of our departments, uh, in order to meet that goal uh, to to develop a championship pipeline here. And and so, how long that takes, that's not a question I could really put a number on but i do know we're putting the effort into doing that and you know the fact is we we're already seeing some of the those fruits they might not show up in the wind column right now but everyone's excited about hunter everyone's excited about nicola dolo everyone's excited about graham ashcraft everyone we have the rookie of the year and jonathan india we have tyler stevenson who's a soon-to-be all-star catcher it's the future is very bright and we're already seeing a lot of that at the major league level. Awesome. Nick, I wanted to ask you uh, about some of the other things that you've done outside of baseball in your analytics career. I think uh, some of them are really fascinating to me. You took a break. You had, you've had two tenures with the Reds, and in between, you were actually a data scientist for KFC. So h- how was that, and how did that come about? Yeah, it was... Uh, everyone did something weird during COVID, you know, like the, I feel like everyone did a, co- a, everyone had like a COVID thing, you know, uh, yeah. like, did you, did you get into like painting or something? What was your COVID thing? Uh, I mean, I, I, I started a math tutoring business that went nowhere. They like see, that. see, yeah. Everyone did something in COVID. Yeah. I think the site is still up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, okay. So COVID hits, and and so, and you do a COVID thing. So my i I was with the Reds twenty seventeen to twenty twenty. I felt my career path. I wanted more of a managerial or leadership opportunity, and I didn't see a very direct path here for that. Uh, an opportunity came up at KFC which would put me in a managerial position. I was the first data scientist hired at KFC. I was going to be able to hire on uh, the first data scientist. I was going to be the manager of data science. Um, So being the manager of data science, hiring the first data scientist by title at KFC, started building out the, the data science department at KFC. We were housed in digital marketing uh, our goal was to optimize whether it was digital marketing campaigns or innovate on our menu or innovate on our different ways we look at customer profiles and, and how we do customer segmentation, how we do customer segmentation analysis and lifetime value, whether it's customer lifetime value or product lifetime value or whatever these different, uh, you know, fairly rote or typical <laughs> marketing finance analytics right. are. <laughs> yeah um, exactly yep but you know it's 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 important to know that not all these you know fortune 500 companies out there have gigantic robust data science teams a lot of them 
they actually have relatively small teams and those teams perhaps are are trying to do the work of like a team that's the size of 20 but they just don't have the cycles they just don't have the hours to do it so uh, you you end up coming into a, a situation where you start a data science program with two people and you're expected to have all these products by you know a few weeks but it's because the company has never had data science so they don't know that just for the model training and right. validation and QA and code review and then into production that could take months, you know? So, right. um, so, so let me get this straight. You were like the first person classified as a data scientist to be hired at KFC. That's correct. And then you hired one person to help you. That's correct. <laughs> okay. And then you guys do great work, right? Uh, I, I believe so. One of the, one of my most favorite projects we worked on was beyond chicken uh, so we brought vegan chicken to KFC. Uh, well, a team of us brought vegan chicken to KFC, and uh, I did help out with a lot of the test market analysis and and what that projection looked like nationally when it came out earlier this year. I believe January was when it came out. It was so successful that it actually stayed on as a promo for two months. Usually KFC promos last one month. Mm -hmm. uh, so it ended up, being so successful, we ended up doubling it, uh, and and I felt really good about it. It sounded like you know something that something rare that happens at KFC is usually very very important because KFC has been a a very stable brand for many decades. So any random uh, occurrence that happens, any any outlier is is truly truly a, a something that is off the charts at that company. So what would be an example of, of how you use data analytics to help with this, this vegan chicken launch? Yeah. The first thing is uh, for a company that literally sells meat products, who would come in and buy this out of our returning customers? Right. Okay. Like, so when we put that, when we put the, when we put the item on the test markets, we had to do some returning customer analysis, see who bought what, who was most interested in buying it, who, who, when it was in the test markets, who bought it again. What do those, uh, what do those particular customers buy when they're not buying vegan chicken? And uh, it, we we noticed the trends of people who were more into individual sized meals. Uh, in particular, they were interested in chicken sandwiches. They were interested in the new fries. Uh, a lot of them uh, bought at our sister company, uh, uh, Taco Bell. Uh, and that makes sense because Taco Bell has probably one of the most uh, vegetarian friendly menus out there. Uh, so uh, all of these things made sense. And I said, if we're going to do a deal, it would make sense to, to pair uh, the Beyond Chicken in a combo that does offer something like a chicken sandwich or fries or, or something. And uh, I believe the deal, I believe the first deal was if you ordered in the app, if you ordered vegan chicken in the app beyond chicken, you would get a free chicken sandwich. And that I think every single place, uh, almost every single area had a sellout. At least one of the stores ended up selling out of, of vegan chicken, huh. but there was, it was one of those, like, there was sellouts everywhere. It was, like, in very high demand, which is why we ended up extending it another month. Right. So whether it was, like, the niche of vegan chicken at KFC or whether it was a little of the deal that people got, like, if you didn't like it, you still had a chicken sandwich to go to. Uh, I, I want to say that I, I helped a little on all of those fronts. That's very cool. So it turns out there was probably more of an overlap with your existing customer base with people that would want vegan chicken, like yeah. at least more than you expected. Absolutely more than I expected. I it It's always interesting to me because uh, I think when we promoted it the first time, our the president, uh, he Kevin Hochman, Hawkman, uh, he went on record saying, yeah, the... 
the vegan chicken isn't really for vegetarians and vegans. The vegan chicken is for people who are interested in vegan chicken. And he got a lot of like blowback on that because it's like, wait, you're making vegan chicken and it's not for vegans. What are you talking about? But really what he was trying to say, or at least what I think he was saying was what I said in one of our meetings, which was vegan chicken is for people for returning customers, vegan chicken is for people who are interested in more of the menu, like people who are just mm-hmm. sure. trying to explore a menu that they're very used to and seeing any new item on it. Maybe they're very interested in that item. And so uh, it was more of a more of an idea of like, if it is a returning customer, they're probably just going to be a very curious customer who purchases vegan chicken. I do think an extremely large group of people <laughs> who have never ate at KFC before came to KFC and ate beyond chicken uh, since it is literally one of the only vegetarian items that we offer at KFC. But uh, I, I, I mean, I think about it this way too. Like there's a group of people out there who have never tasted like the KFC 11 herbs and spices recipe because it's been like a meat product. Right. So this has opened up the Avenue of KFC for so many different people. I, I, I always thought that that was a cool thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. So Nick, when I was when I was preparing for this interview, I was it, it was really cool to see like how many different things that you've been into. Like you make your own music, um, you worked as a music journalist for a while, and I, and I wanted to ask you, you know, like how do you like does that help you find inspiration for your own work in baseball analytics and 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 not only that stuff, not only the artistic stuff, but also analytics in other areas, whether it be football or soccer or whatever. Yeah. I, you know, you know, I, (laughs) this like goes against a lot of the things that I try to like promote out there in the public, but I do think that there are some intangible things that humans, individuals really do have. And creativity is very, very difficult to teach. Um, And you being a person with, you know, you've done a lot of different things. You got a podcast. You're a creative guy. Um, At least, at least I think you're, you're, I think you're a creative guy, Ed. I think you're creative. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. You're welcome. You're welcome. I, I, uh, I do think there is something to be said about someone who's really creative. They're going to be creative in whatever medium they end up in. Right. Like no one talks, like everyone talks about the creative artist who does, who makes their own music or paints their own paintings or does their own pottery or whatever they do. Uh, not a lot of people talk about the creative analyst who has a lot of perspectives on how to view objective, factual things, whether it's yeah. data related or how we measure something. There's a lot of famous analysts or famous statisticians of our time who are famous because they view the world in a slightly different way than the rest of the world did. And now we have things like, you know, Dean Oliver has brought so many things to us. Um, the The idea of, uh, you know, the work Ron Yurko and Sam Ventura did over with uh, the NFL uh, expected points added metrics, right? Like these are, these are things that in the math world should be pretty, pretty straightforward, but in the, the sports world, it's historic in a lot of ways. It's a way, it's, a, it's truly, uh, it's truly creative in, in their application of why they do things. And I, you know, not to put myself in any echelons that I just mentioned, but, you know, one thing I didn't know was any of that. And knowing that I was taking statistics from neuroscience and trying to apply it to sports as well, that was a creative process of mine. I don't think a lot of people were doing. It was helping me for a very specific reason to understand statistics better. But I could see where if there was value or if there was something interesting that popped out of one of those weird analyses I did, then perhaps I would find something that no one else has found before. I never did, but that mm-hmm. would have been interesting. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's just a matter of you never know when you're going to find stuff. Um, right. Like that's right. It, it's, uh, I mean, we're thinking about what the past decade that I've been doing sports analytics, you know, I mean, there've been so many things where like, I'm so sure that this is going to be interesting. Like this is going to work. This is going to be a great NFL totals model and no, just nothing. Right. And then you're, and then sometimes you're like, Oh, I gotta, I gotta figure out, I gotta figure out how much a bye week is worth in football. This is boring. 
and it actually turns out to be really interesting. Right. Um, so, you know, it's just, I, I think it's just a matter of trying things, right? I think, I think the two, I mean, as a creative person and, and you mentioned, you know, you had a COVID business and it didn't go the way you wanted it to, but you knew to some extent that if it didn't go the way you wanted it to, that's okay too, right? Like, and, and I think that's a part of being creative is also uh, understanding that failure is a part of creativity. Uh, for, for all the things that I've done in my life that was creative and creative attempts at things, there's a mountain uh you know it's like the iceberg metaphor like at the tip that's what we see but like below what's underwater it's just uh all these yeah. failed attempts and ideas that's... of things i tried you know yeah absolutely and also in your field of baseball analytics i almost feel like creativity is a must right because it's such a well plowed field and to make any kind of progress to differentiate yourself from 29 other teams you, you got to think outside of the box, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's no, you know, I, I'm not throwing out buzzwords when I say people are using computer vision to look at video, right? That's uh, uh, that's not necessarily a, you know, a secret. There's a lot of different things where you take video data, you use something like alpha pose or open pose, and you do some sort of like stick figure representation of biomechanics. That stuff exists out there in the computer process or the computer vision field now the the idea that you could take that and do that in sports or you could take that and do that and augment the way we look at things like there was a note there's a couple different notebooks in the big data bowl where people took the tracking data and they turned it into like first person view of the tracking data or they turned it into like overlays of pitch control during the video replay of a of a play. Um, so there, there, so there are people who are being really creative, not just in baseball, but really anywhere right now in the public sphere of interesting ways, not just to, to, to create new metrics and analytics, but also to visualize new metrics and analytics. It's a, uh, it's really, it's really inspiring to be honest. Like when I see that kind of stuff in a different field and it's something that truly I haven't seen in this field and they literally pay me, eight hours a day, quote unquote, eight hours asterisk a day <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, you know, eat, breathe baseball. Right. Uh, and to be impressed by something else that I've seen in a different sport, it's, it's, it's really a rarity at this point. So, so right. there's creativity all over the place. It is rare, mm -hmm. but it's out there and, and it is, yeah. it is always so inspiring to see. So you really don't think creativity can be taught? I I think the I think how people have been creative can be taught. Like what like what my creative process is when I'm writing a song or when I'm building out a new model or when I'm testing hypotheses, I think if I talk aloud about why or how I'm approaching things, I think people can see how or why I'm doing it. But to replicate that step for step I don't think that's creative. I don't think you're teaching creativity either. I think you're teaching perhaps a formula to get to the same endpoint I got to. But the creativity really is like the association between what you're doing, experience, and what you hope to see, right? It's an intersection of of a wild guess and having the enough resources to, to test the guess. Um, and I think... I think it's hard to teach that. I think it's hard to teach creativity. Right. I would say that I think creativity is more of a mindset, right? Like what is a mindset that lets you come up with these hypotheses, right? And that's going to be different from everyone. But, you know, I think it, like in some sense, if you can create, if you can create an environment where y you have a mindset that says, okay, well, I, I don't know if I believe this. Let me think of other ways to think about it. I mean, I think that's the sense in which you can create, uh, sorry, the sense in which you can teach creativity. Like I think a lot, I think about that a lot with my children, right? Because I want them to be creative. And I guess the, I mean, I guess it's a lot, but but the thing I can do is is create an environment where you do question things, where you do try to think differently, where you don't take things for granted, right? Yeah, well, I, it's interesting you say 
the, the last few things you said, I, I, I think there is some sort of overlap between critical thinking and creativity, but I don't necess- I, I think the Venn diagram for me is a little smaller than what you're describing. I think okay. like, I think like, for instance, uh, like a escape room might be a good vehicle of creativity, but also I don't necessarily know if it is creative, right? Like an escape think, room, meaning like, like a, you know, th- like if you're a, they, they have these like escape rooms where you go, you pay like, you know, $10 to get in and you have to solve like a bunch of different puzzles in a room in order to escape the room. You've ever done an escape room before? No, I've never heard of oh, it. Oh man. You gotta, you, you gotta, you gotta Google an escape room in at, pot p- listeners please recommend some escape rooms to add please <laughs> all right sounds good <laughs> okay so you gotta solve a puzzle to get out you gotta solve a puzzle to get out it's like a physical thing like it's you and your friends in a room you and your family in a room and there's like several several different puzzles and you got to get out of the room um and and these puzzles themselves they aren't like since it's like a physical room and I'll describe one I went to. It was like a crime scene and uh, you had to find the clues in order to catch this criminal. But then it turned into this like saw ripoff where, uh, oh, I've turned this room into like a a trap. And unless you can solve the rules to get out, like I'm going to, you know, do something not nice. Um, So uh, the these puzzles, you know, they're in locations where they're just, they're not like on tables, right? Like sometimes like you got to crawl under a table, grab a key, that key unlocks a box. That box is like, has a puzzle in it. That puzzle has a riddle. That riddle does this other, like there's just like a whole chain of events that has to happen. But you yourself have to be creative as to like where to find all the clues, right? They're not, they're all hidden. Um, So I do think like maybe there's an engine there where it's like to test the limits of creativity. You also have to test the limits of like what a person, how, how far out of the box will a person go to get information? Sure. Uh, Sure. And, and I don't necessarily think that that dovetails or Venn diagram. Is that a verb? Venn diagrams. Well, well overlaps, (laughs) right? Yeah. That's, that's a better word. (laughs) Um, There's not a ton of overlap for me when it's like, if you have to think outside of the box, but you also have to think logically, a lot of the time for me, logic is uh, within some sort of construct of reason or reasonable outcomes. And those are usually historical and looking for a key under the table for most people is not necessarily in the realm of like logical or a a historical thing that people have done. So I, I don't necessarily know how much creativity is being, being critical and, trying to think, uh, you know, what is a different way to approach something versus what is something we've never done before? And what is something no one has ever thought about this particular problem before? Well, the logic thing is interesting, right? Because, I mean, you're suggesting, certainly in what we do, there's logic, there's a constraint to data science, right? You you can't just go out and say two plus two equals five, for example, right? There's a constraint in terms of mathematics and and, you know, the creativity is how do you, how do you, right? In some sense, like, how do you make something new within those constraints? Um, right? Is right. That, that's, okay, great. Would you say that, like, when you're making music, is that the same thing? I mean, I guess there's logic constraints there, too, in terms of the chords and... Yeah, you have to be in key. Yeah. There's, there's definitely logical constraints there. I'd say, I'd say where music... Where music is very much mathematical, or where where music is very much uh, uh, logical, is what you just mentioned. There's uh, you have to have certain parts to a song. You have to have a key that you're playing in, so it sounds nice. Uh, if you're writing a song, the lyrics have to, you know, also you have to sing in key. Now, all these things also are like rules that are meant to be broken in. Like, there's a lot of musicians out there who have tried to be out of tune or there's actually a very interesting uh there's a very interesting woman on twitch who was able to sing out of key perfectly it's so like dis yeah it was so dissonant and gross and like it was like 
each note that per like is the worst note to pair with uh like uh she was able to sing in all these all these like dissonant notes and it was like remarkable and it sounds so bad but it's like very impressive if you are like someone who's been through like music appreciation or has gone through music theory it's it's very difficult to sing out of key that specifically it's it was that's very impressive that, that's like equal equal parts intriguing and horrifying yeah it's it really was like a like this is something i've never like i've never heard this before but i know what this is this is out of tune but this is so out of tune this is like you're trying to be out of tune but is there a logic to the way she's out of tune oh yeah 100 percent. that's why it's like so interesting because yeah it's perfect logic it's perfect perfectly out of tune it is each wrong note that you could be and uh and the creativity there is that like one humans hate hearing things that are dissonant like that but two we're like for you know just the way we're constructed it's very difficult to sing out of key or be out of key if you're if you're trying like a lot of the time even if you can't sing your worst karaoke is still kind of in the key or at least around it. Yeah. So let me try to summarize what you're saying. I, th- I think you're kind of uh, against the notion that creativity is just kind of this intuitive process, right? And more that creativity has to have some kind of structure because anything that we're trying to be creative with has a logic to it that you can't just ignore. Right. I, uh, is, right, is, right. There like, is there like Bayesian... Bayesian creative creativity is, is I feel like there's like some priors that are needed in order to, and that's the logic. That is the that is the logic. It is you're, yeah. You're it, if you're playing a board game, there are many different ways to win. Uh, you still have to play in the rules. Yeah, I think I'd have to think about that analogy a little bit more. But but yeah, I mean, but but the idea is that there is a logic and structure to the world, and we we must. I don't know. I mean, didn't Feynman say stuff like about this? The famous physicist? It's very possible. It's very probable, in fact, that he said yeah. something about that. Nick Wan, thank you so much for your time during a busy baseball season. Uh, please let uh, everyone know where they can find you on the internet and where they can find your music and your analytics and any other projects that you're into. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And you could find me, Nick Wan. On Twitch, that's where I'm mostly at, twitch.tv slash nickwan underscore data sci. Uh, there, there's like some there's some link somewhere, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link in the in the notes for sure. Got him. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter. That's twitter.com slash nickwan. And my music is under the name Farewell Nickwan. You can find me on Bandcamp. Yeah, and it's very cool. It's it's pretty awesome music. I'm I'm looking forward to listening to more of it. <laughs> Thanks, dude. And uh, Ed mentioned that me and him met at uh, our sports analytics meetup. Me and the great Eric Eager from PFF put on a Cincinnati sports analytics meetup the first Friday of every month. Uh, you could come check out our next one. Follow me or Eric on Twitter for more info. Awesome. And Nick, uh, you also have uh, some more things you're going to be on doing on Twitch in the upcoming month. Absolutely, I uh, so I I took a break from Twitch uh, over the last four months, uh, and I am returning to Twitch. So I'll be streaming again August fifteenth. Uh, every Monday, I'll be trying to do a talk show format. So not unlike this, Ed, you know, like okay. just, very just cool. a couple dudes talking, right? Yeah. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, um, so. My understanding was when you first started the Twitch, you would just like code something. Oh yeah, I. That's very. The, cool. the the origins of the Twitch was uh, when I was in grad school. Uh, I was inspired by Chris Albin. Uh, he kept a blog of his hours dedicated to dissertation writing. I <laughs> I wanted to uh, do something similar, so I. Uh, streamed myself doing my my analyses in MATLAB, um, and yeah, and so it got me to do that. It got me to write my dissertation, and then that was 2016. So 
from 2016 to now, it's sort of evolved into somewhat of a coding stream, but I also do more like tech news reporting and reacting. Uh, there's a big community. We all are either data scientists or sports analytics nerds, and uh, it, it's really fun. So I uh, uh, I miss it, uh, I uh, and I'm glad I'm coming back. Uh, we used to have a game show called Slice that was a competitive data science. Uh, and and uh, apparently at the RStudio conference during the keynote, they shouted out me and Meg Rizdahl, who who uh, created Sliced, uh, since it was such a big hit last year. So nice. very <laughs> that was, cool. Yeah, that was very unexpected. So uh, it, yeah, I I hope to do more game shows, more talk shows, uh, more more data science community engagement. No, I think that's that's excellent. Uh, when when a friend of mine was running the Michigan Sports Analytics Society, as in the University of Michigan, you know, he would have me come give a talk. And, and I was like, what do you want me to talk about? And he would say, we just want to learn. So I would just go in and I would code something up in front of them. And I think it went over really well. And it's basically the same exact thing that, that you started your Twitch stream doing. And I think, I don't know. I think I need to get back to that. I keep getting distracted with this betting thing. I really need to get back to my roots of, uh, of coding and, and teaching and, and, and just kind of showing the beauty in data and analytics. So uh, yeah, maybe we can work on some stuff together. I would love that. You know, I uh, just, just as a, you, you might, you might think it's crazy, but maybe you think of doing these podcasts, maybe once a month, do it live on like Twitch, you know, like it's a easy, it's an easy way to start and it's something you already do. Awesome. Nick, thank you so much for your time. Ed, thanks for having me. Absolutely. This is Ed Fang, host of the Football Analytics Show. I really hoped you enjoyed that wide-ranging conversation with Nick. As we talked about in the show, I met Nick when I went down to Cincinnati to go to an analytics happy hour. I was going down to talk to Eric Eager of PFF, but I met Nick along the way. I really think it's important to get out and meet people. If you're trying to break into the sports analytics field, there's really no better way to do that. I try to get out and meet people because I want to get new and interesting guests on this show. And I've been waffling about going to the NFL Combine for the last couple years. I'm definitely going to make it this next year. Just a reminder, you can get my free sports betting email newsletter. Go to thepowerrank.com. As a bonus, I'll send you my top five sports betting podcast episodes Definitely something that you want to check out as we head into football season. Once again, that's thepowerrank.com. We're heading into August this next week. This is going to be the last podcast for a while that is not primarily about American football analytics. Honestly, I anticipate the next non-American analytics football podcast will be before the World Cup where we will talk about some soccer. But uh, this upcoming month, we're definitely going to be getting back into football and betting. I'm really looking forward to the guests and the episodes I have planned in August, and I hope you give those a listen. Once again, my name is Ed Fang, your host for the Football Analytics Show, and I will talk to you again soon.